Okay, well, thank you for all, com uh, all for coming to the uh, second talk. So um, uh, I'm going to um, do a quick review of uh, some notions I uh, introduced uh, yesterday and also add a few extras which I didn't talk about, so I need a little more background. Uh, and then um, I'll talk about spatial geometry and, uh, and uh, related notion of gravitational mass. Uh, and then I'll talk about positive mass theorems and beyond. And then in part four, I'm going to talk about some very recent work, which is actively being developed now, which is a different approach to, um, um, to some of these problems, in particular um, uh, the, uh, problem, the scalar curvature uh, problem, which arises uh, in this theory. Uh, and it uses, instead of um, uh, the traditional uh, approaches, it uses actually harmonic forms, which is a more, in some way, a more classical um, approach. Unfortunately, it, it's, it's somewhat limited in applicability, but it's still quite interesting. So I want to describe that in the, in the, uh, in the fourth part. And so let me just um, recall from, um, from yesterday's lecture that um, uh, general relativity uh, involves the study of curved spacetimes. So it's a, a four-dimensional manifold, and uh, <clears throat> G is a a Lorentz uh, signature metric, and that the G represents the gravitational field. Um, then there may also be other matter fields present on the spacetime. And so um, the, um, the uh, Newton's law, which dictates the motion of a test particle, is replaced by the condition that a test mass uh, follows a time-like geodesic in the curved geometry. We described that yesterday. So you can use your intuition about surfaces to uh, understand certain aspects of, uh, of uh, curved geometries. In, in a way, the um, Riemann curvature tensor really reduces to uh, curvatures of two-dimensional surfaces. So you can think of taking slices, two-dimensional slices of your manifold, and your intuition about two-dimensional surfaces and the influence of curvature is, is quite accurate in, uh, uh, in higher dimensions as well. Uh, and so we talked yesterday about Minkowski space, which is the the pointwise model uh, for a general Lorentz metric, uh, and it's also the, the metric on the, uh, the flat spacetime. So if we take R4, we called yesterday R31, and we take the scalar product, or writing it in, in geometric terms, if the coordinates of that are x0 up to x3, then it's, uh, it's the, this metric. So these mean the same thing. Um, and so uh, that's called Minkowski space, and it's, it's it's, it's the flat spacetime of general relativity or the spacetime of special relativity. And of course, the structure of this space is very important. It determines the, the uh, time-like uh, null and, and uh, space-like directions. And so those, of course, play an important role in, in uh, relativity, as we discussed yesterday. Um, OK, and so um, uh, a Lorentz metric on a four-manifold, four-dimensional manifold, is just an assignment of a scalar product on the tangent plane at each point so that at any, at any given point there's a basis for the tangent space in which G agrees with the Minkowski metric. So, so, it's a, so, at, so at a point you can always choose a basis for the tangent space so the metric is exactly at that point, the Minkowski metric. On the other hand, um, uh, around 1850, Riemann uh, understood the obstruction to being, being able to do that locally. In other words, if you ask the question of can, can you choose a coordinate system uh, near a point so that G in, those, in that coordinate system is the Minkowski metric, then the answer to that is that's true if and only if the curvature is zero. So the, the uh, and Riemann derived the obstruction to doing that, and that was the Riemann curvature tensor. And so I won't write down the full curvature tensor, but let me just say that, that from it, we can construct by taking traces. So, so these are averages, if you like, of uh, uh, components of the curvature tensor. There's the Ricci tensor of G. That's a, that's a, uh, it's a symmetric form, just like the, the metric G itself is. So it's of the same type. It's called a symmetric 0, 2 tensor. And then there's the scalar curvature, which is a function. And that's just the trace of the Ricci with respect to G. Okay, and those are the quantities that enter the Einstein equation. So, so these, it's important to notice that they're, these, are tr these are averages of curvatures. And so, and so their vanishing does not imply that the spacetime is flat. So, so the Ricci curvature can be zero, and this, the metric can still be very complicated. Um, and so, um, so as I 
described yesterday, the, the, the hardest part of uh, developing general relativity was understanding uh, how the space-time metric uh, uh, was determined. And, and um, uh, we wrote down yesterday the system of uh, equations which called the, the Einstein equations. And a priori, this, this is a, a 10 by 10 system, it's 10 equations for 10 unknown functions if we write it locally. Uh, and the T is the, it comes from the matter field, so it's the stress energy tensor of the matters, matter fields, and it measures the, um, the uh, energy density and momentum density of uh, the matter fields as, as observed by uh, the various observers in the, in the space time. Okay, and so I'm gonna do something mathematical today, but it, it's also of interest in, in some areas of physics, in particular for certain dimensions, it, it, these kinds of questions come up in string theory. Uh, uh, but, but I'm really a mathematician, so, so uh, what fascinates me is, is the sort of questions that are motivated by the physics, which turn out to be really interesting mathematical questions as well. And so we're going to look at this in higher dimensions so, um, also. So we can look at an n plus one dimensional uh, space time. And so uh, when n is three, that's the physical dimension. And then the Einstein equations can still, still make sense. And, and one can still pose the initial value problem, and it's still a, a perfectly um, reasonable mathematical theory to, to, uh, to study. And so um, uh, let me also mention that the case t equals zero is, uh, is important in, um, uh, in, uh, in the theory. So that's, those are called the, the vacuum Einstein equations. And so they correspond to, to, um, um, to uh, a space-time without matter but the metric is still quite non-trivial. You can specify initial conditions. So it's like a, so think of it as a, um, a freely propagating, it's analogous to a freely propagating electromagnetic wave through empty space. So, so, the, so you can, you can th this is a perfectly good equation to solve. You can pose the initial value problem. So that's called the vacuum uh, Einstein equations. Um, okay, and we talked, we had this same slide yesterday. We talked about the, um, uh, the, uh, the way the solutions are determined for the Einstein equation. So there's a, a three-dimensional, or in general, it would be an n-dimensional uh, uh, space-like hypersurface. So that means that the Lorentz metric on that surface, restricted to that surface, is Riemannian, positive definite. Okay, that's what space-like is. Space-like's equivalent to that, and so it, it, it's the same as saying that there are no null or time-like vectors in the tangent plane. So the, tan the surface intersects the tangent, the tangent plane intersects the null cone at a point only. And so uh, this is a picture of dependence of fields uh, on, uh, based on initial data. Um, and so as I mentioned yesterday, the initial data for the uh, Einstein equations um, uh, are the uh, induced metric. So, so that, that means that only the components of the metric that are tangential are, are assigned. That, that may sound a little weird because, because the metric itself, the Lorentz metric, is a four by four matrix of functions. The initial position is only a three by three matrix, right? So you, you, th you don't consider the normal components. And so that, the fact that that's the correct initial uh, data has to do with the coordinate invariance of the equation. So the initial value problem is a bit more subtle than just for an ordinary wave equation. And so, um, so, uh, so that's the induced metric. Um, and then the other uh, bit of information is, is the second fundamental form. So that's the rate of change of the, um, of the metric when you move in a, per in a normal direction at constant speed. Uh, so uh, so these, the P plays the role of the initial uh, velocity. In the, in the theory. Okay, now there's, a, there's somewhat more to say about, um, about the um, initial value problem, which I'm gonna introduce also as background. So, so, um, um, so, so as, assuming you have such data, and they have to satisfy some conditions called the constraint equations, which I wanna describe uh, in the next slide, but um, there's then a, 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 a um, local existence and uniqueness uh, result for the initial value problem. And it reduces to uh, a system of nonlinear wave equations uh, in, in an appropriate gauge. So again, there's always this problem of changing coordinates and that you have to fix uh, a good coordinate system to, to do that. Um, but, um, but the initial value problem can be posed. And, 
In particular, given initial data, there's a, you can evolve and you can uh, uh, construct a uh, globally hyperbolic, which we talked about yesterday, which is a predictable space-time. And uh, there's a sort of general Zorn's lemma type, type argument, which gives you a unique maximal globally hyperbolic development. Um, okay, and so um, the thing about globally hyperbolic uh, space-times is that they're topologically a little bit boring in the sense that the time direction is trivial. So, so in the globally hyperbolic case, the space-time is just topologically the product of the initial data cross an interval. Okay? And so, um, so, so in particular, any sort of topological complication occurs in the, in the initial uh, uh, data set or in a Cauchy surface uh, M. Um, and so um, the... Um, so the other important thing which I now want to introduce is, is um, the, 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 um, the fact that the, um, the um, metric, the induced metric G and the second fundamental form are not freely specifiable for the, um, for the Cauchy problem. So, so you can understand this from, for if, you, if you remember your uh, surface theory uh, in, in the Euclidean three space case, but the same thing is true in uh, in, in Minkowski space or in RN, and that is if you ask the question, given a G, a Riemannian metric G, and a, uh, a conceivable second fundamental form, so a symmetric zero two tensor, are those the, the, the metric and second fundamental form uh, for an actual embedding locally into uh, flat space, either Euclidean or Minkowski? And, and the answer is usually not, so, so that's an overdetermined problem. Uh, to do that, and so and so, there are compatibility conditions that are required, and th those are the uh, the uh, conditions, the equations you learn in geometry. They're called the Gauss and Kadatsi equations, differential geometry. So, so there's a theorem in geometry called sometimes the fundamental theorem of hypersurfaces or or surface theory, which uh, which says that <clears throat> if you have a metric G and a second fundamental form P, and if they satisfy, then they they are realized on an embedding if and only if they satisfy a system of equations. Those are the Gauss and Kadatsi equations. And they, um, there's a, <clears throat> um, th those, are, those are the compatibility conditions for, for doing the local embedding. Now, um, in relativity, we're not embedding in a flat space, but for example, let's suppose we did the vacuum Einstein equations. Then we would tr be trying to do the same sort of embedding problem uh, into a zero Ricci curvature manifold. And so, again, there are obstructions to being able to do that. And those are certain traces of the Gauss and Kadatsi equation. So the, the Ricci is the trace of Riemann, and so, and so the, obstruct, the compatibility conditions are, the, are traces of the Gauss and Kadatsi equations. And so that set of equations is called the constraint equations. And it is a necessary and sufficient condition for local solvability of the vacuum uh, initial value problem. Okay, and so I'm going to write those down. So you'll recognize the first equation is looking something like the, uh, the Gauss equation. So the Gauss equation, remember, for a surface in R3, expresses the Gauss curvature in terms of the second fundamental form. It's a quadratic expression. So in this case, um, there's a trace in higher dimensions. This is the scalar curvature of M. M is the Riemannian uh, manifold, the initial data set. And then there's a quadratic expression the second fundamental form, that's the trace of the second fundamental form squared and then minus the norm. And then the Kadatsi equations, if you recall, are, are first order equations on the, in the second fundamental form. They, they express the fact in flat space that the, the covariant derivative of the second fundamental form is a fully symmetric three tensor. Okay? And so that's not, so when you take a trace of that, you end up with the statement that the divergence of not p, but this pi, which is p minus uh, trace g times trace p times g is zero. Okay, so this is a set in in this is a set of equations. So the first one is a scalar equation, and the uh, the last set of equations there is a vector equation. And so there are um, there are n plus one equations. So in three dimensions there would be four equations. So there are four constraint equations. So in other words, that system of Einstein equations we wrote down is actually not really a, a completely a hyperbolic system. It's, it's, it's a system of 10 equations, but four of them are conditions on the initial data. Okay? So there are four equations which are, which are um, um, 
usually, I mean, depending on how you formulate them, they're usually either elliptic or parabolic. And then there are six equations, which are, which are actually wave equations. So, so that's a, a, a very important uh, uh, aspect, and that's sort of what makes the constraint equations are really what, what constrains the data in, uh, what, what yeah. What is P sub ij, which of n? Which is which? P, P sub ij. P sub ij is, is, is the initial second fundamental form. So the initial data, so you start with the three manifold, you have a Riemannian metric on it, and you have a second fundamental form, which you expect to be the second fundamental form for the evolved spacetime. When you when you embed it, it corresponds to the uh, the the initial uh, velocity of the of the gravitational field. So this is the initial condition. So all of this. All yeah. So in in order to solve the vacuum Einstein equations, the g and the p have to satisfy this set of four equations. So the, the in other words, if you had a solution to the Einstein equations, when you they they restrict to non-trivial constraints on the initial data, and so you can't hope to solve it unless you have these be satisfied. And so the initial value problem involves specifying a uh, manifold with a g and a p, which satisfy the constraint equations. And then the theorem says if you have such a thing, you can solve the, the uh, you can find the space time. So going to the equation that's time dependent, you are going to tell us what that is. Right. So what happens is, uh, it's, I mean, actually, the similar thing happens in electromagnetism. Um, the constraints evolve. Uh, so in other words, uh, when you evolve them, you, um, you, uh, they, they continue to hold in future time. So if they're imposed initially, uh, and when you set up the Cauchy problem, you have to show that they, uh, the constraints, in fact, do evolve. Um, if you're really solving the right equations, they have to evolve. Right? So they're similar to the uh, conditions that div E is 0 and div B is 0, if you solve the Maxwell equations with initial data, electric field and a magnetic field. So they're, but of course, those are much simpler. Uh, Equations and so the the constraint equations are already rather non-trivial. The particularly their non-linear uh, equations. Um, well, the second one is linear, uh, but but it does it's non-linear in the sense that th this covariant derivative involves g also. It's so uh, um, and the first equation is clearly non-linear. Um, okay, and so um, so if you, if you write them down for um, for the um, uh, a space-time with matter. Then of course there's a the, the, the right hand side is, or the left hand side I, I switch sides is no longer zero but there's a there are terms involving the stress energy tensor okay and so so the first um, the first term there this mu is t zero zero okay and so the the picture is you have the space like hypersurface the the time like unit normal is the you think of as the world line of a of an observer okay and then t zero zero is the the energy density uh, uh, for, uh, observed by that observer, okay? And the, the J, the Ji here, is T0i. That's just the momentum density observed by the, an observer moving perpendicular to the, uh, to the uh, uh, initial data. And, and so the dominant energy condition, which we discussed a bit yesterday, implies that this, uh, this um, energy momentum density vector is always time-like or null. And so... Um, so in, so, so in particular, the, um, um, right, so we'll talk about energy conditions on the next slide, but th this is the, the, these are the constraint equations in the general case when you have, uh, when you have uh, matter present. Okay, and so we talked last time yesterday about uh, energy conditions, and so, and so again, just, just like uh, the theorems I'm going to talk about are general theorems, so they don't make any hypotheses on matter fields, and so in order to say, say anything meaningful, you have, to, uh, you have to assume that the matter fields are physically reasonable. And uh, the, the definition of physically reasonable here will be the dominant energy condition. And so we described this yesterday. Um, <clears throat> you can write it either uh, as this is non-negative for forward-pointing time-like vectors. And it's equivalent, as I said, just by uh, a linear algebra <clears throat> argument to saying that the, the energy momentum density vector is time-like or null. And so, and so that's the condition that mu is, first of all, non-negative. That's the energy density. And it dominates the, the, the momentum density vector. Okay, so that's the, the difference of those two. Or the, if you square it, is the, exactly the, uh, 
square length of that vector. And so you want that to be, uh, that makes it, <clears throat> that makes the vector a time-like or null vector. Okay, and so, and so notice that this condition, based on the formulas we have, are expressed entirely in terms of the initial data. So, so the, this involves the initial metric, that's the scalar curvature of the initial metric. This involves G and P, and this also, the covariant derivative there involves also the, uh, the initial metric. So, um, um, right, and so um, in particular, this inequality using the Einstein equations uh, gives us a condition uh, which is solely expressible in terms of uh, G and P. So, so it's a condition on G and P. So if we're given uh, G and P, we can ask whether or not the, the dominant energy condition is satisfied um, for those. Okay, and so in the, in the time symmetric case, um, so it's called time symmetric in relativity because P equals zero corresponds to initial velocity zero. And so if you solve, which is a perfectly good uh, initial condition. If you solve it with initial velocity zero, then the transformation t goes to minus t will be, a, will be an isometry. Okay? And so, and, and so in, in physics, they call it time symmetric. It's often in math, mathematics, mathematical uh, relativity called the Riemannian case, meaning that there's no extra tensor. It's just a Riemannian, a condition on the Riemannian metric. Uh, G. And so in that case, um, we, we have mu, which is the energy density, is one half the scalar curvature, and of course J is zero. So the dominant energy condition there is equivalent to the scalar curvature being non-negative. Okay, and so one of the reasons that I've been studying non manifolds of non-negative scalar curvature for most of my career <laughs> is because they're, they, they're precisely the, the initial data, at least in this uh, time symmetric case, for the Einstein equations. And so so that's, they're also, also the condition is of interest in, in Riemannian geometry. Of course, it's a natural curvature inequality to study. Um, okay, and so th those are the energy conditions. And so um, uh, we can then, so, the, so, so, the, so there's, a, there's a sort of conundrum in relativity that again goes back to the beginnings of the subject. And, and that is when you, when, you, um, when you have a physical field um, in special relativity or uh, whatever, the field usually has associated with it an, a, a, an energy density, right? So, so if you choose a, a space-like hypersurface, you can define on that a, uh, you can define the energy of the field. So for, for um, the Maxwell um, energy density, would be the, the integral of E squared plus B squared, the, the, the sum of the two. There's a positive energy density that's Defined and for the scalar equation, it would be the, the potential energy, the integral of grad, uh, grad uh, u squared. Um, and so um, uh, gravity, unfortunately, does not have that feature. So, so um, one of the things, again, because of the coordinate invariance, um, is that <clears throat> although the Einstein equations are second order, there is no energy which is first order which, which um, is related to them. And so the reason for that is that there are simply no coordinate invariant quantities involving one derivative of a tensor, of, of a metric. So you can always, uh, in fact, it was already known to Riemann that you can always choose coordinates at a, uh, a near a point where the first derivatives of the uh, metric are zero, right? And so in particular, there's no meaningful expression involving first derivatives. So, so there's, no, there's no energy density for the... Uh, gravitational field. And so, and so the problem of assigning a gravitational mass to a spatial region is a very hard problem and it doesn't really have a unique answer. Uh, it's, it's actually a much studied problem also and I, I, I won't really have time to touch on it. There's a notion of what are called quasi-local masses. But, um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, we saw the Schwarzschild solution yesterday and in those solutions there is a mass parameter, right? And there, there was a parameter M which is uh, uh, thought of as the mass of the, of the black hole, which is described by Schwarzschild. I've rewritten the Schwarzschild solution here. I wrote it in a little more explicit form. So, uh, so the, the metrics defined on R cross R3 minus a ball, and uh, this is in spherical coordinates, so I've changed the time coordinate to T, R, theta, and phi. And um, <clears throat> you can see that this metric here, this metric there, is just the metric on the two-sphere standard two-sphere, and so, and so um, uh, this is the, the metric we wrote down 
yesterday, uh, and <clears throat> it's a vacuum solution describing a, it's a static solution of the Einstein equations, and uh, there's a mass parameter, m, which is greater than or equal to zero. And so, um, um, and so you, again, it's, 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 an, it's, it's analogous to the uh, Newtonian potential. So if you take a, a point mass m in Newtonian theory, then the, the potential is a rotationally symmetric uh, harmonic function in that case, which is, is singular at, the, uh, at, this, at the, the point where the mass is located. And so um, we described this space last time, and so, and so this is a picture of the extended solution. Um, and so this goes out to infinity, and, and you can see from the uh, formula that if we take r very large, then these terms go to zero, and uh, it approaches uh, at a rate of 1 over r, the Euclidean, or the, the, um, the, uh, the Minkowski metric, right, as if we let r go to, go, to in, go to infinity. So if we think of taking t equals constant, then that term's not there. And then this is a, a metric which near infinity uh, uh, approaches at a fairly good rate, at the rate of 1 over r, uh, the Euclidean metric. And so, so those ends really flatten out, and they look like, they look like uh, Euclidean space. Um, an appropriate rate. And so um, uh, it leads to the notion of what are called isolated systems in relativity. Namely, you could ask, well, suppose instead of a, a black hole solution, I had some complicated local system of uh, gravity, maybe a solar system or galaxy, and, and then um, uh, and let's assume everything else is infinitely far away, like we do in Newtonian theory, right? When we do the, the planetary motions, we we only consider the gravitational effects of the, of, of, the, uh, of the sun on a single planet. So similarly here, we can, uh, cons we can consider w what are called isolated systems, and those correspond to manifolds which are asymptotically flat. And so, um, so I made a sketch here. So the, the idea here is that there's some sort of arbitrary structure in the, in, in the interior, but near infinity, things fall off in a nice way to, to uh, R3, so I'm thinking here of the initial data uh, uh, for the problem. And so, um, so it requires uh, the metric to approach the Euclidean metric at a certain rate and P to fall off at a certain rate. And so um, I'm just going to, there's a, a, actually a complicated story as to what the optimal rates of fall off are in order to do this, but, but um, uh, I want to first of all motivate it and then I'll, I'll talk about special uh, rates of fall off. So, so let, let's go back to Newtonian gravity, which we did last time. So we have a, a mass distribution rho, which is compactly supported. Uh, and then as we, oops, I misspelled gravitational, but um, uh, we, we can determine the gravitational potential by solving this uh, PDE. So Laplacian phi is minus 4 pi rho, and the limit goes to zero. So we can always solve that uniquely, assuming rho is continuous or something like that. Um, and, then, um, um, uh, and then we can write the mass. Well, what is the mass? Well, the mass is just the, uh, the integral of rho, because rho is the mass density. Uh, or we could also write it as an asymptotic integral, um, using the fact that <clears throat> um, the solution phi satisfies the, uh, this equation. So if we integrate both sides of this equation on a large ball, then the left-hand side is, um, is a divergence, so we can write it as a boundary term. And that boundary term is uh, the integral of d phi dr. And so we can also write the mass as this asymptotic limit. It's a kind of flux integral. Um, and so um, S sigma is just a, a, a sphere of radius sigma, which is tending to infinity um, in, this, um, in this formula. Okay, and actually, we could choose it centered at any point we like. Um, or alternatively, we could write an expansion for phi. We could say phi asymptotically is of this form. So it's m over mod x, and then terms that go to zero quadratically for x large. And then we can also compute the mass as the, the leading order term in the asymptotic expansion. So this is saying that if you look at the mass distribution from far away, then it looks like a point mass uh, with, uh, uh, with total mass m. Uh, and you could even also, if you center it right, you can get rid of the quadratic decay term. So you, you can say it looks like a point mass centered at, at its center of mass, right? And so, and so from the asymptotics of phi, you can recover the various moments of rho, the, the, the total mass, the center of mass, and, and also uh, other, you know, other higher, higher moments. 
And so, um, so in general relativity, um, as I said, there's no mass or energy density for the gravitational field. Um, and um, so, so again, for the matter fields, you do have such a, such a thing. But, um, but it, so it's not possible to compute gravitational mass by integrating anything, by integrating a density. On the other hand, the asymptotic expressions do make sense if we assume the, uh, the manifolds are asymptotically flat. And so the simplest assumption uh, would be that, uh, uh, sort of in analog with the uh, Newtonian case, that the metric looks like a Schwarzschild metric. So I've actually written the Schwarzschild metric here in slightly different coordinates. So this is a different description of the Schwarzschild. It's the conformally flat form. Um, uh, and so uh, this leading order part is just, is, is just the spatial Schwarzschild metric. And then there are other terms that fall off faster. Now the sub two there just means that you, 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 you can differentiate the fall off. So in other words, the, it's a term when you differentiate it falls off one order faster. And you have to be able to differentiate twice because we, we want to compute curvatures, right? And so, um, and so this number m, so if we have had a metric and we, if, if we assume that it has a leading order Schwarzschild part, then we could define the total mass, and that's what ADM did in Arnowit, Desser, and Misner did in 1959, I think, um, uh, as this number m. So, the, so the, the m would be the total mass of our complicated system. It doesn't have any symmetry, or we don't know what it, what it, satis what it does, but if, if, it's, if it looks from far away like, like a, a Schwarzschild solution, then we could just say, let's take that, the mass of that short shield to be the, the mass of our system, or our general system. Okay, and so um, let me just say that the, the mass can actually be defined in much, much more generality. So there's a, there's a flux integral analogous to the one that we looked at in Newtonian gravity. It's a little bit complicated, so I don't want to describe it here, explain why it exists, but, but, it, but you don't have to assume the metric <clears throat> is is exactly Schwarzschild near infinity, as long as it falls off at a, a reasonably rapid rate, which you can precisely quantify, then this, this limit will, will exist, uh, and uh, it's defined to be the mass. So there's a normalizing constant, and then it's the integral over a large <coughs> sphere of uh, certain first derivatives of the, of the, uh, of the metric. Okay, and so, um, uh, and so there, there's, also, there's an analogous ex expression for linear momentum, which I, I won't write down, so it depends on the, the, the second fundamental form. That's a, and so, um, <clears throat> so that's called the ADM mass. And, and in, in 1959, ADM, Arnowit, Desser, and Misner defined these quantities, and they studied, they actually studied the initial value problem from a Hamiltonian point of view using these, these quantities. And so, and so it gives you a notion of total mass and total linear momentum. Later, people define total angular momentum, requires a little more, uh, more um, strict decay to, to, to do that, but they're all defined in a similar way. So, so the idea is that <clears throat> because the metric is asymptotic to, uh, asymptotically flat, the, the, so, so generally these quantities are conserved under the evolution. So the, the, so the uh, conserved quantities are usually associated with symmetries of the, of the, um, uh, of, of the space in, in, uh, in mechanics, and so, and so because the metric's asymptotically flat, it doesn't have exact symmetries, but near infinity, there are translations which give you essentially this, the mass, and there are also horizontal translations and horizontal direct, time translation, horizontal translations give you linear momentum, and rotation killing vector fields give you corresponding angular momentum. And so while, again, these are not exact symmetries, they're asymptotic symmetries, and it's possible to show that this, these asymptotic limits exist because of the asymptotic flatness. Okay, and, so, and so that's um, uh, the sort of the ADM idea going back to this 1959. And so, um, and so uh, I'm going to now talk, uh, describe the positive mass theorem, and I'm going to only do it in the special case when p is 0 because it's a bit more complicated. Otherwise, actually, the proofs are also more complicated. But um, so... Um, <clears throat> So, um, so, this, um, so what it says is that this mass, so assuming the dominant energy condition, uh, this mass is always non-negative, and it's zero only if, um, um, well, so actually in the space-time case, it means that, 
that MGP can be isometrically embedded into Minkowski space. So when P is zero, it means that um, the manifold is isometric to Rn. And so, and so in other words, what it says is this very complicated system, as long as it satisfies the, domin the, the matter field satisfy the dominant energy condition, it will always have uh, positive mass. Unless it, it, and the mass is only zero if, if the system is trivial. Right? So that's, that's what the positive mass theorem says. And so, um, uh, yeah, so this pre more precise statement, it's asymptotically flat and the dominant energy condition holds then <clears throat> the mass is non-negative at zero only if the space-time is Minkowski. So it doesn't mean that M is necessarily R3, but it, it could be any space-like hypersurface in Minkowski space. That's the general theorem. So let me just say, until recently, the theorem was only in the literature under additional assumptions. That is if we assume, so the three-dimensional case was done a long time ago. In higher dimensions, the story is somewhat more complicated. And so uh, in tomorrow's talk, I'm going I'm to uh, describe <clears throat> describe that, how, how that works. But, um, uh, but today I'm just going to uh, talk about some of the ideas involved, and then I want to, in the fourth part, describe some recent work, which really only applies to the three-dimensional case, but it, it, uh, it gives some uh, slightly different point of view on, on these things. So, so actually, um, in the case P equals zero, remember our assumption is non-negative scalar curvature. And so um, there aren't very many methods in geometry that, that detect the scalar curvature. Um, but one of them was discovered uh, around 1960 uh, by uh, Lishnerowitz, and it was developed by Atiyah and Singer. Uh, and it has to do with the Dirac operator. So, so it turns out there's a, there's a close connection. In fact, I have the down here. So, the, so again, you, you may or may not know what the Dirac operator is, but it, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's an operator which arose in physics. Uh, uh, in the flat case, and was, was, it's, it's sort of non-trivial to extend it to the non-flat uh, non uh, manifolds, but it was done by uh, these authors, and in particular, Atiyah and Singer in the index theorem uh, calculated the index of the, the Dirac operator as a topological invariant. And so, um, and so the, um, this was done in the early 60s, and then these methods were improved by Hitchin, and then systematically developed by Grumoff and Lawson in the 80s. And so the, the Dirac operator is actually a first order operator. It doesn't act on functions or, or tensors. It acts on sections of a, of, of a bundle. So it's called the spinner bundle. So there acts on spinner fields. So it's constructed, you know, it, um, it's constructed from the, uh, uh, the, the manifold structure, but it's not the tangent bundle uh, 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 it's, not the, it's, not a, it's not one of the standard tensor bundles. Uh, and so, um, so this can be defined under some, some conditions, and that's the, sort of the, the catch in, the, in, in, in this approach. And that is that in order to, de to do this argument, to define spinners, the manifold M has to, has to be a spin manifold. Okay? And so that's a topological condition on, on the manifold M. Uh, but if it is spin, then there's a beautiful uh, connection. So if you have a... Uh, a spinner S, then, then you can write, so D is the Dirac operator. So D is actually a square root of the Laplacian. So when you do, uh, so D star is, um, is, uh, is related to D, and so D squared is something like the Laplacian. So D, D star D is, the, is minus the Laplacian. Uh, and then there's a scalar curvature term. The zero order term, uh, if you do it on a curved manifold, gives you exactly the scalar curvature. So th this formula is the key to the relation between uh, spinners uh, and uh, scalar curvature. And so in particular, um, uh, Witten, uh, uh, and this was actually done a few years after we did it by other means, uh, used the Dirac operator to prove the positive mass theorem. So the rough idea is that if M is asymptotically flat, you can construct a solution, it's called a harmonic spinner, uh, ds equals zero, where s is asymptotic to a constant spinner, right? So the manifold falls off, it looks like Euclidean space, so near infinity you have these, the uh, constant spinners which are uh, almost solutions, and so the idea is to construct an actual solution asymptotic to those, uh, and then you write this formula, um, so the left-hand side is zero because, because ds is zero, and so um, this formula then is, is just that, and then if you take the inner product with S and integrate by parts, you end up with, over a, a large ball, 
you end up with this quantity, and if r is non-negative, this is a, a, non, a positive quantity. Right? And the right-hand side, the, the, the second term is, 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 is a flux term. It's, a, it's an integral over a large sphere. And then uh, it turns out you can show that the boundary term converges as r goes to infinity to a positive multiple of the mass. Um, and so in particular, you end up showing the mass is non-negative. So it's a very simple uh, program to do it. And it does prove the positive mass theorem in, in lots of cases. But the, the catch is that the, it only works, it works in three dimensions always, but it only works in higher dimensions if the manifold is, uh, so is uh, spinned. That, that you are directing attention to is associated with the minus the integral there at the very end? Yeah. yeah. So that integral comes from the uh, using. And that's a uh, surface integral. That's a surface integral, right, exactly. So this is an interior integral, and the other is a surface integral, right? And so it's the surface integral that converges to the mass, the flux term. It's a little bit like the Newtonian picture that we saw, right? We had Laplacian phi is minus 4 pi rho. We integrate over a big ball. The Laplacian gives us a, a surface integral and, uh, converges, and converges to the mass. So, so there's, um, um, that's the uh, rough sketch of the Dirac upper. So as I said, this uh, works in general dimensions, but it, uh, it does require the uh, spin assumption. Um, Okay, and so um, uh, a few years earlier, um, Yao and I had developed a, a, a different approach to this, which uh, exploits the connection between minimal hypersurfaces and scalar curvature. And I'm going to describe this more in detail tomorrow, but uh, we, we used it to prove the positive mass theorem. And, um, um, <clears throat> and so uh, I've got a sketch of it here. It, it involves um, a kind of inductive argument. So, so uh, the idea is that uh, if you start with so the very general idea is if you start with positive scalar curvature, when you, when you look at a minimizing hypersurface in that manifold, then it has very similar properties to the ambient manifold. In other words, if the ambient one has positive scalar curvature, then the, uh, the hypersurface also carries a metric with positive scalar curvature, and then you can slice down. So it's a kind of inductive sort of slicing argument. And I'll talk about it in more detail tomorrow. But... but um, um, uh, eventually, it reduces to the two-dimensional case, and, and, um, uh, which comes essentially from the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. And so um, the, the problem is, so the proof works beautifully in all cases, except <laughs> that it, it, there's a difficulty in higher dimensions. So, so it, and the problem is that, that um, a, very, a rather strange and inexplicable uh, phenomenon occurs for the plateau problem. Namely, if you, if you minimize volume, um, uh, you look at a hypersurface, which is volume minimizing, uh, in high enough dimensions, you can have a small singular set. So it turns out they're, they're regular up to dimension 7, and then in dimension 8, you can have isolated singularities. In higher dimensions, you could have a, a very thin singular set. It, it's a, a, a set, a closed set of co-dimension 7, roughly, Hausdorff co-dimension 7. So it, it's a set which can have very complicated structure, so we don't really know. So uh, the, volume minimizing Surface. Right. But are you implying uh, uh, that the hypersurface is compact? Uh, no, it means on compact sets. So if you have a non-compact hypersurface, it means if you intersect it with any compact set and you replace the hypersurface inside uh, oh, that compact set by a new one, uh, it always increases the area. Yeah, oh, oh, that's what it means. Yeah. So it means uh, maybe the, a better term would be locally minimizing. Yeah, you always consider compactly supported. Um, uh, variations um, or comparisons, yeah. Uh, okay, and so again, I'll, I'll talk more about that tomorrow. But um, let me just say that the uh, positive mass theorem um, um, actually has a lot of uses that are, that are maybe a bit surprising in, in the higher dimensional case. And actually, Avner mentioned the Amavi problem uh, in the introduction yesterday. And so it turns out that question, the question of constructing metrics of constant scalar curvature, is also is intimately related to the positive mass theorem. In particular, it's the positive mass theorem which enables you to get the estimates you need in some cases. So there, it's a rather complicated story, which I won't go into, but it plays an important role in especially the low dimensional cases. Uh, and um, uh, also, um, there's, there's a famous theorem in relativity which characterizes the Schwarzschild metric as the unique static black hole. So, so in other words, if you have a static black hole solution, then it's automatically rotationally symmetric. And so 
And so that's a theorem in three dimensions that goes way back in the theory. And um, there's a, to do it in, in the n-dimensional case, or even to simplify the proof in three dimensions, there's a very nice argument using, which uses the positive mass theorem. And then there's another, I mentioned Penrose yesterday. So Penrose uh, also um, uh, had a, um, uh, a, a scenario for, for black hole formation. And so uh, a test case for that scenario was what's called the Penrose inequality, which is an inequality that relates the, the, the mass to the area of the uh, event horizon. So generally, the positive mass theorem says the mass is always positive. The Penrose inequality says if you have a black hole, that means a, a trapped surface, the mass is actually bigger. It has to be larger depending on the size of that, that, uh, that um, the boundary of that, uh, that, um, that surface. And so, and so the, the, the Penrose inequality is a sharp inequality for that. And again, the, there's a proof of that. So that was originally done by Huskin and Ilmanen in three dimensions. And uh, Bray gave a different argument, and was, which extended to higher dimensions, which again uses the relies on the positive mass theorem. So it has a lot of um, a lot of a lot of applications. Okay, and so um, in the remaining ten minutes or so, I want to talk about um, uh, a recent. So again, I'll talk tomorrow about about some more details on the minimal hypersurface argument, but I want to talk a, a bit about um, uh, the connection between scalar curvature and harmonic forms, which, uh, um, which has, was found just within the last couple of years. And so, um, and, so um, the, and this uses the idea of, sometimes called the Bachner method. And, and actually the, the, proof, the spinner proof of the positive mass theorem would be an, an, an example of what we would call the Bachner method, where the, the linear operator is the Dirac operator. So, so for harmonic forms, the linear operator is the Hodge Laplacian. And so it's a, it's a different uh, operator, but there's a similar argument. So, so this goes back to Bachner's original paper on the subject. He derived um, uh, what's called the Bachner formula. So, so, so recall that a, a harmonic form, so if I take a Riemannian manifold, then um, a harmonic form is one that's closed. So it represents a Durham cohomology class. Uh, and it's also co-closed. So, D star is the adjoint, the L2 adjoint of D, which, which uses the Riemannian metric. Right? And so these are the equations. Now for a one form, these are particularly simple. The, um, the uh, locally closed condition says locally omega is D of a function. Uh, and the second equation uh, really says it's really a divergence uh, uh, equation. And so it says the divergence of the gradient U is zero, so it means U is harmonic. So that's the Laplacian. Uh, and then Bachner, in his, in his paper in the 40s, uh, derived this formula, which, which relates the, um, the, uh, the Laplacian of the norm squared of omega to a term involving the first derivative, and then a term involving the Ricci of the Riemannian manifold. So it's the Ricci curvature in the omega direction. Well, omega sharp is the vector field associated to, to a one form. So, so the metric enables you to identify the tangent space with the cotangent space. So, so you, can, <clears throat> you could think of a, um, uh, a one form has an associated vector field. And so this is a Ricci in the direction of that uh, vector field. And so um, more explicitly, if we wrote it in terms of the local function, it looks like this. So that's the Ricci in the gradient direction. And so this is a very important identity which has used, been used to study Ricci curvature for years. There are many, many papers that rely on this um, on this uh, identity. And so Bachner, yeah, question? Hmm. And the uh, domain on which this is defined is a one, uh, a Riemannian one, or is it a uh, Lorentzian? This is a Riemannian one. So, the, so we're, we're now looking at the initial data, which is, oh, has a Riemannian metric. Yeah, so this is only in, on the initial data, okay. not in the space time. Right. Um, Right, and so and so Bachner used this theorem to uh, this uh, formula to prove a, a theorem in uh, back in the 40s in his original paper. Uh, he proved that uh, if the Ricci curvature is positive and you have a compact manifold, uh, then then there are no non-zero harmonic one forms. Um, and so uh, and then appealing to Hodge theory, uh, this implies that the first Durham cohomology space vanishes, and hence the first Betty number of M is zero. So it gives a topological obstruction. Uh, for positive Ricci curvature. And uh, the proof is quite straightforward. You can simply um, uh, integrate this formula. If you integrate it over a compact manifold, this left-hand side is zero, 
And so uh, you get that the zero is that integral. And then if uh, th this integrand is non-negative, and it would be strictly positive un unless omega is identically zero. So, so it's a, it's a, the first example is called a vanishing theorem in, in geometry, which is they're sort of omnipresent. But the subject. manifold would not have to be necessarily compact. Well, so uh, it does for this formula. If it's not compact, then you then when you integrate the Laplacian, you get boundary terms or something, right? Or you get asymptotic terms. So there are there are non-compact versions, but they're more subtle. They have to be looked at carefully. Um, okay, so um, so as it stands, the the formula has to do with Ricci curvature and scalar curvature. Of course, is much much weaker, uh, a much much weaker assumption, positive scalar than positive Ricci. But recently, a young mathematician, Daniel Stern, found an interesting way to use the, the same Bachner identity to get some information on three manifolds. And I'd like to describe that, because there's actually a whole lot of work going on uh, sort of expanding that idea uh, over the last couple of years. Probably been 20 papers written on it. And so, um, so let me first. Um, um, go back. So actually, the idea really comes from what we did for stable hypersurfaces. So let me first summarize that. And so um, there's something quite similar for, for hypersurfaces, minimal hypersurfaces. And so if we assume that sigma is stable, meaning that it's locally minimizing for area, minimizes up to second order, uh, and also that it's, that it's two-sided, so it has a globally defined unit normal, then uh, we get this, the stability implies this eigenvalue condition. So the, the function phi here um, is thought of as defining a variation of the hypersurface. So phi times the normal is a normal variation. And the left-hand side of that expresses the second derivative of the volume when you do that, when you deform in that direction. So that's a quadratic expression in phi. And you see it's of a rather simple form. It's the, the Dirichlet integral, the gradient phi squared. And then this is just a function times phi squared. And so it's, uh, uh, so this can be, we can take any smooth, compactly supported function. And so this quantities that appear there, the, the Ricci is just the Ricci curvature, and the A squared is the sum of squares of principal curvature. So it's the square length of the second fundamental form uh, of sigma, the hypersurface. Um, and so, um, and again, that's equivalent to the lowest eigenvalue of this operator being non-negative, Dirichlet eigenvalue on any domain. And so in particular, um, this immediately implies there are no compact stable hypersurfaces in a manifold of positive Ricci. Because I could choose phi to be one. If, if sigma is compact, I can, I can take any choice of phi I like, and so I take it to be one. When I do that, this term is zero, and I get that the integral of minus this quantity is non-negative. But if the Ricci is positive, that's just a contradiction. right? So, so similar to the Bachner idea in a way, and in fact, it's interesting to compare the, the two. And so, um, so combining this, and then we can combine it again. So Hodge theory is replaced by the existence of minimizing hypersurfaces. And so in particular, in any co-dimension one uh, integral homology class, we can construct a minimizer using, in, using geometric measure theory. Uh, and then that gives us the consequence that the first, the n minus first Betty number is zero, and that's actually equivalent to the Bachner's conclusion, right? So it's the so instead of looking at one-dimensional objects, we look at n minus one-dimensional. Okay, and so um, and so now what we observed long ago is that you can actually get information about scalar curvature from this, and it involves some calculation. I'm a little short on time, so I might just because I may go through this again tomorrow. Let me just uh, uh, cut to the chase and and say that the quantity that appears uh, there, this quantity. If you remember, that's the term that appears there, Ricci plus norm A squared. Just using equations of differential geometry can be rewritten in terms of scalar curvatures plus a positive quantity. So, so that by a manipulation, that's one half the difference. You could say the relative scalar curvature. So the ambient scalar curvature minus the scalar curvature of the hypersurface, and then plus a positive, a non-negative function, norm A squared. And so um, stability then becomes this. And it, let's say we're in the three-dimensional case and sigma is compact. Then again, we can choose phi to be 1. And what do we conclude? If, if Rm is positive, we take phi to be 1. That term is out. What we conclude is the integral of R sigma is greater than 0. Okay? But R sigma is the, twice the Gauss curvature. 
So this, on a surface, the scalar curvature is actually two times the Gauss curvature by the convention we use for scalar curvature. And so in particular, we can use Gauss-Bonnet and we can argue that the Euler characteristic of sigma is positive. And so sigma has to be homeomorphic to either S2 or RP2. And so if you combine that with, the, uh, with existence theory, uh, we can actually show that using this directly that lots of three manifolds cannot carry metrics of positive scalar curvature. For example, T3 or a connected sum of T3 with any, any other compact three manifold. So Stern uh, was able to do part of this using harmonic one forms in the Bachner formula. And there's an advantage to what he does in that there's a kind of explicit formula uh, that comes up. And so I want to just spend a few minutes at the here, end of the talk here describing that. And so, um, so first of all, yeah, question? Yeah. Oh, OK. Um, OK, and so, um, so first of all, um, you, it's enough to consider the case of integral one form. So you can assume that the periods, so I said a, one, uh, a closed one form is locally d of a function. Well, that function is only defined up to an additive constant. But if we assume the period, the periods of the, of the one form are integral, then, then the function is well-defined mod z. So, so you can replace the harmonic form by a map from m into s1. Okay, now given a function on m, you can then write the integral, this integral is called the co area formula. Uh, the integral of f times the gradient of u can be written as a double integral. So you can integrate over the level surface, that's the level set u equals theta, of f dA, that's dA is just the area measure of the level surface, and then integrated d theta over s1. So that's called the co area formula, it's a useful thing. And so um, using the co area formula together with the Bachner, formula, which we saw had terms involving gradient u in it, uh, Stern found a surprisingly simple formula. So he showed that the average Euler characteristic, so 2 pi times the average over S1, so you have this map to S1. If you take a regular value, then the pre-image is a smooth surface, so it has an Euler characteristic. Then when you average, uh, almost every value is a regular value, so, so, <clears throat> so uh, you can ignore the set of measure 0 for which this doesn't make sense. And so he proved the average Euler characteristic is bigger than a, a very explicit integral, which is rather interesting. So this is a non-negative term, and this is the scalar curvature. Okay. And so, um, so the proof uses a, a, a manipulation similar to the one we did for uh, uh, minimal hypersurfaces, but it uses it on the level surfaces instead of, uh, and which are not minimal, of course. Um, okay, and so in particular, uh, this has a consequence that uh, it gives a new and simpler proof that T3 cannot carry positive scalar curvature. So this follows from the fact that um, if you look at sigma theta, the level surface, then, um, then um, no level surface can be, a, no component, it could be disconnected, but no connected component can be a two-sphere. Um, uh, and the reason is because a two-sphere in T3 would bound to ball, a region homeomorphic to a ball, and so the, the map U would then be single-valued, because the ball is simply connected, uh, be a single-valued harmonic function, but it's constant on the boundary, because this is the level, the, the level surface, and so it would be constant on the boundary, so by the maximum principle it's constant in, in an open set, and that says the map is trivial everywhere. Okay, and so, uh, so in particular it gives a very, in, you know, in principle a very simple proof of the, uh, uh, the T3 case. Um, and so pr prior to that, there were, I mean, it's, it's very hard to, to prove the theorem for T3. That was actually a challenge problem a long time ago uh, related to the positive mass theorem. Uh, and so, uh, and so, so, so you, you think if you can do that, you can probably do things like prove the positive mass theorem. Now there's a catch, though. So, so it turns out to handle uh, a manifold more complicated than T3, say even something like T3 connected sum with some other, some other manifold like S1 cross S2 is a, tip, is a good example. That's a manifold of positive scalar curvature, if I just take the product metric. And so I could take the connected sum. So that means I join, I have a T3 and I join it to, and I join it to this other manifold. So I cut out a ball in each one, and I form a new manifold by, um, <clears throat> by joining the boundaries of the ball and smoothing out the, uh, the edges. And so, um, 
Right. So, um, so such a manifold, of course, shouldn't have positive scalar curvature. And the minimal surface argument immediately shows that it doesn't. But, uh, but this argument uh, actually doesn't quite work because when you do the level surfaces, see the S1 cross S2 has some non-trivial two spheres. And so you may, have, you may have components which are two spheres and the statement that the average Euler characteristic is positive doesn't necessarily, uh, sorry, is uh, less, uh, yeah, is, is, is positive, it doesn't, isn't really violated there. So you could conceivably, um, <clears throat> you don't directly get the, the proof. So, so it turns out um, it is possible to do it, but with an assist from minimal surface theory. So one of the flaws of the, one of the weaknesses of the argument is that you do need to use some minimal surface theory. So minimal surface theory allows you to cut these two apart so that, so that the boundary is a minimal two-sphere. And so, and so using minimal surface theory, you can reduce the more general case to the problem of T3 minus balls where the boundaries, uh, where the boundary spheres are minimal of zero mean curvature. And it turns out the argument does work allowing boundary spheres with zero mean curvature. And that was done uh, in a follow-up paper by Bray, Hugh Bray and uh, Daniel Stern. And they showed that there can be no such metric like that. So, so combining with some minimal surface ideas, you can handle those. And so actually the method has been, has been proved remarkably flexible. Uh, it, it was extended to so you can directly prove the positive mass theorem in a more constructive way uh, if you assume the manifold is homeomorphic to R3. Again, there's the same problem of, of um, uh, having more complicated topologies. Or again, you can do it by cutting along minimal spheres to handle general topologies. So this is a paper of Bray, D. Katsaroff, Marcus Curie, and, uh, and Stern. Uh, and then further extensions were done to the space-time case. So, so I, haven't, I won't really talk about that, but there's a, a somewhat more uh, challenging problem, which is where the scalar curvature non-negative condition is replaced by the dominant energy condition. So you, you don't assume that the second fundamental form is zero, but only that it satisfies the, uh, the energy inequality, dominant energy condition. Okay, and that, those are called in in mathematical relativity lingo, it's called the space-time case. And so in the space-time case, it turned out this argument could also be generalized. So instead of looking at harmonic functions or forms, there's some nonlinear operator which, uh, which involves the second fundamental form, and uh, it was successfully done and there's a, by these authors, Bray, Sven Hirsch, Katsuris Curie, and also my postdoc, Yu Yu Zhang. And actually, more results were, were obtained by these authors. My student, Tinyao Tsang, a current student, has also made nice contributions to the area, allowing certain types of singularities and, and uh, localizations in some cases. So, um, so, it, so it appears that many geometric results about positive scalar curvature can actually uh, be, uh, be proven using this sort of what I'll call level set method. Um, Okay, and so as I said, the drawback of the method is that it doesn't handle more general topologies directly, and it seems it really hard to generalize to higher dimensions. So, so, so far there hasn't been any, any, <clears throat> any way of using this method in four dimensions or higher. And so I'll, we'll see tomorrow that the stable minimal hypersurface argument actually does, does generalize quite naturally to, to higher dimensions. Okay, so, um, so I think that's all I have, and so uh, thank you for listening. Uh, yeah. So right. So th those those applications I gave were all uh, all all Riemannian. Yeah. Well, uh, it's so so. Remember that if you if you take a solution to the wave equation, then its energy is actually computed on a space-like hypersurface, right? And so and so so the 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 energy really involves the initial data, if you take the energy measured at spatial infinity. So, uh, so it's really a Riemannian thing where the, this Riemannian ma uh, manifold is assumed to be a slice in the space-time. So it's a property of the space-time because the mass is conserved un under the evolution. It's, it's the, um, the, the, the spatial mass. It's like the, um, the, uh, the potential energy and for the a solution of the wave equation. 
which is conserved under the flow. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I just was wondering how this is a time dependent problem. Yeah. Relative mass, right? Well, um, again, ma the mass is measured on a space like hypersurface. So the space time is time dependent, but the, the hypersurface is Riemannian. The mean curvature is space dependent, something which has nothing to do with time. The mean curvature? Um, the, the mean curvature of the positive mass theorem will have to, to resolve the Yamabe difficulty. Oh, okay, yeah. How, what's, the, what's the connection between those two? Yeah, so, so I can tell you the idea. So, so the idea is, as you mentioned yesterday, the problem is that when you, when you try to solve the problem, the solutions can blow up. Now, now the blow up and, and actually can converge to zero and can concentrate at a point. And so what happens is that this point of concentration, uh, so, so, think, so the metric has uh, uh, scalar curvature, which is almost constant. So you're approximating the, uh, the, uh, the original problem. So, so this, this blow up point, you can, you can rescale it and you can produce in the limit. So what happens is the blow up point is like a bubble. And you can, when you blow it up, you produce a metric which is complete and asymptotically flat. And then you can use the positive mass theorem to show that there's a correction term which implies that that couldn't have happened. In other words, it's an indirect argument. You assume you have blow up and, and you, you show that that's incompatible with the positive mass. When you blow it up, you get something analogous to a uh, slice. You get a, sca a zero scalar curvature metric, actually. So it would be an initial data set for a vacuum solution to the Einstein equation. But it is a, it, I mean, it's not a, it's a, it, I mean, the, the evolved space time wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be static. It's, it, it would be a time dependent solution, but this would be a slice, uh, uh, p equals zero slice in there. Yeah. So you were directing attention to these exotic uh, topologies uh, there uh, on a spatial hypersurface. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you were directing attention to the fact that uh, initial value data on this hypersurface has to uh, satisfy certain constraints, and you listed uh, uh, mm -hmm. Do these uh, constraints admit these uh, exotic uh, 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 topologies? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They do, yeah. So the only the only constraint really on a on a uh, uh, t to have uh, uh, a space time satisfying the energy condition is if you take p equals zero that the scalar curvature be non negative. So all of these so you can take um, you can take uh, manifolds with positive scalar curvature. So examples are S three quotients of S three like lens spaces are RP three S one cross S two is positive scalar curvature. There's S1 cross RP2. There's a list. And then you can form connected sums. You can make as many copies of it as you want. They all have positive scalar curvature. So all of them are possible topologies for a, even for a vacuum uh, space time. So am I correct in saying uh, that uh, these topologies w w would be uh, uh, those could characterize uh, the solutions to Einstein, they would satisfy the Einstein yeah. field equation. So the Einstein field equations would not uh, be simply uh, essentially something uh, like uh, Euclidean space on a spatial hypersurface, but uh, rather uh, could have these. Uh, yeah, they, <clears throat> they, they all do. They all do satisfy. Yeah, they, 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 they so their initial data, they satisfy the, there's a unique globally hyperbolic development. Now, the thing is, though, they all have trap surfaces, right? Because, uh, see, the topology forces the, so a trap surface is really a minimal, a minimal hypersurface would be, a, that would be a marginally trap surface. And so whenever you have topology, you can sort of surround it with a minimal surface. So in particular, the space times would never be complete. But, but they, do, they would be vacuum solutions of the Einstein equations. So if you have these funny uh, topologies, you would have singularities all over the place? Well, after a time, there would be definitely some, some singularities. I mean, what might happen is that the, uh, 
you, you, might, you might form a singularity and all the topology might collapse into the, behind the event horizon, say. I mean, that would be a reasonable scenario. And so, so you could converge in the, in, uh, as T goes to infinity to uh, something like a Schwarzschild or a Kerr. That's actually the scenario that Penrose conjectures about asymptotically flat, the long time behavior. Of course, that's very far from being known. It, it, people are, have done some pretty good, have some pretty good results in the perturbative case. So if you assume the initial data is close to Schwarzschild or close to a Kerr, then there are good results of that type. But yeah, the general, I mean, for large data, the, you know, the global, the large time behavior for the initial value problem is not mathematically understood, say it that way. <laughs>